Hi, dear everyone. It is Sunday night. It's eight o'clock. It is time for a broadcast once again. I'm Billy Kirkwood, and I've never heard of me either. Don't worry about it. But you have heard a broadcast. Let me tell you what exactly this show is. Yes, it's put on by the fine people at broadbeardoils.com. Make sure to check them out for all the latest gear that they've got and some of the amazing merchandise, t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, trumpet socks, whatever you might need. It's all over there on the website. But uh, this podcast it is about talking about people from the alternative lifestyle, certainly. But one of the things it is, is it's a lifestyle podcast. We get to talk about people from all around the world, all different walks of life. We have had MMA fighters. We have had BDSM models. We have had comedians. We have had uh, adventurers. We have had, uh, let's see, pro wrestlers. We have had rock stars. We have had actors and so much more. So we always get to talk to someone very, very interesting. And we've got an amazing guest for you today. Before I get to that, don't forget to tag your friend. That'll be one of my kids getting murdered in the background. Ignore that. Make sure to tag a friend. Make sure to uh, let them know that they'd be interested in this type of thing and to share. We are trying to build up a little bit of an army there. You can check out all the archive over at Spotify, YouTube, and just spread the world of all the peace and love here on broadcast. Right, up next, who do we have for you today? Do you know, I sometimes just like we guess just to get into the story, get into their accomplishments, and let them tell them from their side. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. But how to describe our guest tonight? We went with adventurer and mindset coach. I think that's pretty already, pretty much a hook to get you tuned in. So please, ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome to broadcast, let's hear it from Mr. Ted Jackson. Ted, thank you very much. Are you all right with adventurer and mindset coach? Is that all right? I've been called many things. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. That sounds like, I mean, we could make, uh, yeah, it probably sounds a bit, um, uh, a little bit flash, I'd have thought, but little, never mind. A little, <laughs> little bit flash, but I tell you what, we we, let's, we all like to sing our own praises here in broadcast from time to time. Why the hell not? I like adventure because it was trying to just surmise not only the uh, the big adventure, but as well as loads of the other stuff that you're doing right now. And everyone's going to be so diverse and want to spread the message. How would you describe yourself if you were to, in a nutshell, layman terms? Here we go. It's the uh, it's the Tinder profile. Maybe not the Tinder profile. Maybe that's not the one word CV description <laughs> of uh, of, uh, of how you put yourself out to the world. How would you right. describe yourself? I'd just say that I was. Um, I suppose I was an ordinary guy. An ordinary guy who's done some extraordinary things um, and overcome overcome uh, overcoming addiction and alcoholism along the way. Yeah, and proving that Joe Joe blogs everyday Joe public can absolutely go out there and achieve anything because I'm nothing special. I'm not, you know, I'm not. It's not like I'm some kind of elite athlete or was uh -huh. born with special leg muscles or arm muscles that could make me do stuff better than anyone else. But I've kind of gone out there to prove that if you just use a bit of mind strength and and have a bit of grit and determination and resilience, that yeah, uh, you can go and actually go and do anything. Pretty much, oh, I've seen, you know. Pun punching out of the box that other people might want to put you into. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, All I right. mean, if, if you were, especially if you'd seen me a couple of months ago, you'd have thought, what kind of, oh, it's a big box he's in. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm a little smaller now. Well, uh, with, there is there is so much to, to unpack with this, first of all. Right. Uh, well, I, a good place to start with, certainly the thing that's getting people's attentions. Let's let's draw a couple of the, the uh, personal achievements we've had there. Seven marathons and seven continents in seven days. Three marathons at the, Nor uh, at the North Pole Ironman. The Tour de France, uh, principal tenor with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, Concert Orchestra, which was the one that caught me off guard, I'll level uh, with you. Uh, that was the one that caught me off guard. Uh, we've had a helicopter rescue, and you were saying just before we kicked off, there's one missing from this list as well. Well, there's a couple missing from that list. I suppose you've got the fact I did the Marathon de Saab, which is a 250-kilometer two, run through the desert, um, yeah. which lasts over five days through the Sahara Desert. And um, I've literally got back yesterday from rowing the Atlantic and completing it, having failed um, about four or five years ago. So, uh, yeah, literally got back a couple of days ago. I woke up. I just had a fourteen-hour sleep. Actually, you were so. saying. I was. I was. I was about to say, what is the recovery period? I mean, I'm willing to bet you're going to skip a couple of days at the gym after doing something like that. Actually, strangely enough, I got back on. What day is it today? It's uh, Sunday this, night. 
This is Sunday, yes, yes. Yeah, I got back on Friday and uh, immediately got on the rowing machine just to test out my... um, test out whether I was any fitter than when I left and smashed out a personal best on the 2K and then uh, did another 5K yesterday. This is not like me. I don't do training. I have, you know, so so I've come back and immediately got on a piece of equipment that I never got on in the first place. Oh, no. um, But but then you are smashing out a couple of PBs just as soon as you're back. Yeah. And then but, uh, just falling asleep. <laughs> and for, for 14 hours, I think, is on its own quite an achievement. Can we add that to the list? Because I don't think I've ever slept for 14 hours of my oh, life. Oh, I can sleep. I'm good at you sleeping. Can... <laughs> I don't know how long the recovery period is going to be, but I'm guessing a couple of weeks of just sort of... I spent yeah. most of the weekend just staring vacantly into space. I imagine. Just, yeah, just it's kind of weird. You have a big come down. I mean, I've, I've had in events I've done in the past. You often mm. get a sort of real post-event blues, you know, a real come down where you just think life is empty and what have you. This one, I'd say I was a lot more satisfied. I'm, I'm sitting there with a feeling of satisfaction, but I'm very vacant. <laughs> just, uh, my wife knows what to expect. So Sophie's just sort of like, yeah, I know what space you're in. Don't worry. Oh, it's, it's just this, it's just the screensaver. He's conserving yeah. power any minute now. He's going to, he's going to kick back off, but we're going to jump about a little bit because there's yeah. so many different things to unpack here. I, a genuine question. When I heard about the row on the Atlantic, it sounds like such a, a, a silly thing from someone that goes out and runs and does yoga and I, I put my earbuds in and that's for like, you know, 30 minute, 50 minutes in, increments. What is it? What What do you do in order? I mean, what the period of time you do it? What is it you do to just kind of keep things ticking over during that time? Do you have earbuds in? Do you? Yeah, do you just, 40, 42 what? days is a long bloody time, I tell you. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and I've. It's it's very difficult. People have asked, you know, did you get bored? Did you? Hmm. Is, it, is it boring? I would say it was never boring. Uh, right. I would say there were times when it was a real grind and tedious and but it, you just weren't bored because you had stuff to think about. You had to think about, you know, the, where you were going and how you were getting there. And, yeah, you know, you were uh, plenty of times I sat on the oars going, oh, God, here I am again on the oars. But you've got to do your, you, you know, there's no way out. You've got to do the next three hours. And then after that three hours, you can have a three hour rest. Yeah. And then after that three hours, you get the call. Come on. And you're like, oh, so 42 days, three hours on, three hours off with no breaks you know so no oh, wow. no one missed a shift so yeah. i'd gone into it thinking i only signed up with a month to go most people had signed up over a year ago for this adventure i, oh I saw God. it on facebook and thought ah oh, yeah i'll give that a go um <laughs> so people thought i was a bit mad just for doing that with no preparation but that really yeah. suited me um so i didn't have to think about it for too long or worry right. about it um, but I had sort of gone into it thinking, ah, there'd be some really good rows. I'd probably be able to take quite a few shifts off and chill out and they'll row me across the Atlantic. So after a couple of days or well, in the first day, I thought, that's not going to happen, is it? I'm kind of yeah. trapped here. What have you done? You're an idiot. Again, again, you're sitting on a boat like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Because I mean, it's you were you were saying there. It's because there is so much to unpack when you are in when you, when you are rowing. Um, it's I I'd imagine that's quite as well as being physically, it's quite mentally exhausting because you are on all the time, like a, a three-hour period. I mean, if you work in an office, if you work as an air traffic controller, you've got to take breaks mm. during that period, you know, but you're on for three hours and there's your safety. You've got to make that progression. Is it quite mentally exhausting as I well? Would say, I would say it was meant to, that this challenge, I'd say, was more mentally challenging than physically. I would say wow. that around the Atlantic, I'd say over 42 days, you know, physically you get, you know, sure, sure. There's problems. You get blisters and calluses on your hand. You get blisters and wounds on your ass. Yeah. Um, you get chafing where you don't want to get chafing. But, but you know, muscularly not too painful. It's it's fairly low impact. But mentally, yeah. the that is the main impact is that you're on all the time and that you are. You have to be there. You can't run away from your head. It's very difficult to zone out. I've got obviously put the earbuds in. Um, there were times when it was really tough and it was just like, you know, they, they, they'd be listening to music on deck on a, on a boom, you know, on right. these micro, uh, whatever these things are called speakers. Um, and they'd be listening to, you know, a fairly twee playlist. And I'd just, I'd have to have metal in my head. Yeah. Just like I needed loud music and not think because if, yeah, if you go into my head without the help of a grown up, it can be a dangerous place to go. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so in many ways, it was trying to stay out of my head. You know, th th yeah. there's no way I, I couldn't really string more than 10 thoughts together or three thoughts together at a time. You just so I think some people have thought, oh, this will be a time when I really sort my head out. Maybe I'll be able to sort out some things about the future because I'll have time to think about mm. stuff. Yeah. Nah, you may have all the time in the world, but you're so sleep disoriented and sleep disordered that the chance of me being able to think of more than two things at a time were very, very slim. So yeah. in, in many ways, I was a bit like a goldfish and that was OK. That gets you through. <laughs> Maybe having a simple brain helps. Yeah. <laughs> well, even even in saying that, like you're listening to some metal music, not one to think too far ahead because you've almost got to go. You don't you don't want to get too far into your head because then that might even affect your ability to go to sleep. And yeah. you need that. You need that good sleep. You need that 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 real. You I need don't that use whole two and a half hour sleep session. That's what you need. <laughs> there it is, man. Oh, living the dream. There's going to be some people out there going like, "How is that even possible to function in such a short amount of sleep?" That's incredible. We, we, we've got so much to unpack, so I tell you what, let's take a, a quick trip back to the beginning. These adventures, these, um, um, we'll call them adventures, I think, yeah. these, uh, these notarieties that you've done. Um, you mentioned at the start, you're just a regular guy that does a, a extraordinary things. Where does this come from? Where does the first step, because in, in, in people's life, they have those flash moments where they go, I'm going to change this, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get that new job, I'm going to boom, 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 there's all these changes, but I, I imagine you're coming from a different place with this. Where does this first journey into this side of things for ted come from i suppose it's weird just you talking there now now I'm, you've got to remember i'm in an emotional state anyway at the moment so i'm like yes, right yes yes, yes. So it's like even you just talking then and i'm starting to go Ooh, okay um yeah i was i was, you know when i was younger i always just wanted to be a rock star or a film star you know okay. that's what i was interested in doing it was just like being um I just wanted yeah. to be famous. I wanted to be known. Maybe I wanted validation. Maybe I wanted all those things. I'm not sure. But, you know, uh -huh. that's that's what I craved. Right. Um, and I was waiting for someone to come along and discover me. And, okay. uh, you know, I, I wanted. I was like, I behaved like John Belushi most of the time. You know, I was just fat, drunk and stupid. And I thought that that would make me famous. You know, it was the days right. before the Internet. Maybe if the Internet had come along early, I might have been famous for that. But, you know, that, that wasn't going to happen. And basically, I, you know, and it just, you know, when everyone else stopped drinking and doing the bad stuff, I carried on. And then right. it wasn't until I was I was 25 that I, I gave up drinking and, and, and pretty much everything else at that time. Uh, I went into rehab in 1999, was in mm -hmm. rehab for, uh, up until Millennium Eve and came out on Millennium Eve. That was an wow. interesting evening. Yeah. And uh, and then I suppose started to turn my life around and take responsibility for myself and, and understand that the only person that was going to do anything was me um, and started taking a few steps to to change the fact that I was fat, drunk and stupid. Um, so <laughs> uh, and got interested in in maybe doing a few events. My, you know, family members, my brother had had a heart attack. My father was looking at triple bypass type things. So I thought. Maybe hereditarily, I'm mm. I'm staring down the barrel of something. Maybe I ought to get off my ass and do something. So, Go I ahead. signed up. I think the first thing I signed up for was the New York Marathon, right? Um, and just started off with a marathon, and uh, and then after the marathon, it was like, well, what next? And then I had to start looking bigger and better because of my addictive nature. I suppose it was kind of like, where do we go from here? So immediately, I was on to sort of triathlons or you know iron man or oh there's a marathon at the north pole that will be interesting <laughs> um uh and uh, yeah 2006 what did i do I, I, I did the i did 21 stages of the tour de france in 21 days in 2006 that was kind of i'd say that was quite a life-changing event for me yeah um, it was huge you know at 21 days it was you know i'm not an athlete i wasn't a bike rider my mate had called me up and said do you want to do the tour de france i'm organizing a charity event i was like yeah without knowing what the tour de france really entailed and again yes. i was on that day one thinking holy shit what have i just signed up to do the oh god this is bad yeah <laughs> and well, then a, a layman like it. myself would have no idea even what that that would entail but you were just like let's do it i like to jump into things and just say yes and then uh say yes think later and push myself and put myself in a in a difficult situation see if i can get out of it and that's that's where i found i found the most growth over the mm. years and where i've you know otherwise i think i've i've always winged things through my life i'm a blagger i'm a winger I've, you know and 
and that's okay because if you can wing it and you can get through that's yeah. okay but unfortunately it doesn't feel like i've when you do that you don't feel like you've pushed yourself so maybe you think you're undermining yourself by winging it mm. um so therefore to put myself in a few difficult situations then you think okay well i have got through really difficult situations nah there's always an icky feeling going well you just winged it as well but then again yeah. so i'm just coming to terms with winging it's okay yeah, all right. Well, that, that's that's a fascinating way of looking at it because you will get yeah, I'm really looking, yeah, yeah. My analysis is a bit screwed, but there you go. I, I think it's solid. I love the idea as well that you, you can, these positive and negatives even going all the way back, like you wanted to be a film star, you wanted to be a rock star. So you're already looking at life in a different way because you get some people that are young kids and they're like, I want to be, and it sounds ridiculous and some people yeah. are watching this, and but there are, there are some people that watch this and go, I want to be, a joiner i want to be an accountant and you might think no kids don't think that way kids think that way some yeah, do yeah. because it's part of their family and you're taking this journey and you're occupying what was maybe and if you don't mind me using the term a negative space with positive things and yeah. you're 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 attacking these challenges and going well you know the only person that's gonna you're the, you're the what's the what's the phrase you're the you're the star of your own movie the only ah. person that's going to change it is yeah. you yeah. and and you rewrote the narrative. You rewrote the story. This is the Ted Jackson director's cut we're looking at yeah, just now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're playing well, yeah, through with us. The, the irony is, is that, you know, when I was drinking and taking drugs and doing all that stuff, uh, yeah. I was about as far away from being an actual rock star or a film star as you could be. Yeah. And now I would say that actually I live a life beyond my wildest dreams and I live the life of a rock star. And a film yes. star. <laughs> in a, in, but in a slightly different way, you know, yeah. so I'm, I'm pretty content. Definitely, and 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 what what gets me is that when you said, oh, "I thought I'd start off for the New York Marathon," I wouldn't think that way. <laughs> like I would, I think I might buy a bike. I think yeah. I might buy a new pair of shoes. Uh, you're straight to the New York Marathon, which uh, and and you said you weren't a you weren't an athlete. Um, no, how did I'm you not. how did, how did you how did you even approach something like that? I know you said about the element of winging it. Did you did you train? Did you seek other people's advice? Because I think. I know people that will watch this and they're, I think sometimes we can talk ourselves out of a challenge. There is that yeah. little voice, even when you set the point and you talk about winging it. And I don't know if I necessarily, I don't think necessarily winging it is a, a bad thing. Cause no. you meant, you mentioned it was a month out and you went into these things, but then sometimes when people take a year, they yeah. will go, Oh, I've got a year's worth to talk me out of this. Oh, these, yeah, oh, yeah, these yeah. Old, I would say that doing like something like, you know, I've done the Ironman. When I did the Iron Ironman is like running a mar uh, swimming two and a half miles, running a marathon and then riding a bike 112 miles. And That's I've crazy. done that with, you know, and there are people, you know, there's Ironman widows, you know, because their Ironman husband spends every waking hour training, going on runs. And a, I rang my wife. She was away and I rang her on the Thursday and said, mm, what's the name of the lady that looks after the dogs? And she went, why? I said, I'm thinking of doing Iron Man on Sunday. You know, <laughs> she was like, you're mental. What's it? You, you haven't done anything. I was like, yeah, but I just want to see if I can do it. And, yeah. so, and uh, so, and I went and did it. I came last, but I got on the telly, rock star. Um, there you go. But, you know, but did it in under the 17 hours, got the medal, tick the box, don't need to do that again. But I'm well, kind of tempted again. Um, but <laughs> I was supposed to. In terms of how do you prepare for these things, I suppose yeah. the first marathon I did, I did go and do some training. I went running with my mate, Johnny, okay. and uh, and we we went on some runs and got trained. Did I get to athletic status? No, not really. But I suppose I'd got myself into a place where I thought you can go for a run. Yeah. Um, with a marathon, for instance, I'm a big believer, and I do strongly believe this, is that if you as an adult, well, for me, as an adult male, in the UK, you ought to be able to cover a distance of 26 miles on foot at whatever speed it takes. If you can't do that, you need to have a word with yourself because if you were, well, I always use like my kids as an inspiration on that. It's not, not the nicest thing possibly, but let's say we'd had a car crash in the outback and I needed to walk 26 miles to go and get help. You do it. And most yeah. people would do it. However, their physical condition, they do it. So mm -hmm. therefore, go and see if you can do it. And and you're not going to injure yourself going for a 26. Even if you have to walk the whole lot, it's a 26-mile walk. All right, I try and run as much of it as possible. But, you know, get out there and, and see how far you can go. Because what's the worst that can happen? You'll get sore yeah. feet and sore legs, and they'll hurt for a few days.
That's amazing because you'll get people that do like uh, 10Ks or 5Ks, even just walking. But if you suggested to them, you need to walk 26 miles, oh, no, I couldn't do that. You yeah. Might I mean, have to. if you break it down, it's a long way. But if you change the situation yeah, and and, and put it into a disaster situation, they definitely do it. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't go, oh, this is hard. I can't do it. I'm not going to save little Johnny. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. It's interesting because I've heard that mindset described by a couple of athletes, Eddie Hall, the uh, former uh, world's strongest man. He talks yeah. about where he had to go to mentally to lift the, the 500 that he did when he broke the record. And he talked about that. Well, he doesn't go into depth of what the actual thought yeah. was. He goes out of his way not to tell you right. what that thought yeah. is. I don't want to tell you my secrets. Yeah. <laughs> but he does, he does talk about how he had to go to a place that he had to envisage what he was lifting. Yeah, was life dependent yeah. on yeah. Uh, a, that disaster scenario. So, well, some people might look at that as a you know a, a negative place to go to, but it's not yeah. really. It's it's if sort it of gets you there. Yeah, it's that primal. I don't want to say primordial. It's almost primal instinct that we yeah. all still have because you know we were all dinosaurs and saber toothed tigers once upon a time. Who knows? Um, might still but, be. Might still be. Who knows? At any point. <laughs> any point. But the reason I asked about the preparation and I was actually asking about the earbuds is. Um, I know a, a friend of mine who does uh, triathlons, not well, admittedly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and when you did talk, when you did talk about the Iron Man, I did think you got on the TV when you were last, but you know, third last, he didn't get on the TV. Nah, he didn't get nah, on the TV. Nah, so, and I bet you'd be training all that time. <laughs> you'd be training all that time. <laughs> but uh, um, I've got a friend that listens to audiobooks and uh -huh. what have you. And part of me goes, that's just not what I need to get my blood up a little bit to get when I'm in the three days when I'll work out, um, doesn't get my blood up. Um, and that's the reason why I was asking about what you did for when you were training with the marathon, when you're actually attacking those 26 miles or whatever you're, you're having a run in the middle of New York. What, what are, you, are you listening to anything during that? Or is it just the atmosphere and the buzz? Different events, different things. So there'd be, I'd say that, yeah, in New York, you don't need them. You know, you've got, yeah. there was, when I did New York, there was a couple of million people lining the streets. It was hot, so hot as hell. I got yeah. sunburnt on a November day in New York. Um, you know, but there's music, there's bands everywhere you go. Yeah. You get swept along with it. Same with, same with any of the major marathons. I suppose I've done London and Berlin, New York. They're all big. You know, you, it's very difficult to zone out with your own music. There'll be times when you put it on, but generally yeah. not. Um, it's interesting what you said about audio books. I suppose it depends what the exercise you're doing. I, I've, I've tried audio books when I did the seven marathons, just no chance. Can't, you know, my thoughts just run away. You know, the yeah. minute you hear something and I've, I've gone and I've missed half the book before you go. And also it's slow, you know, the rhythm of an audio book, not particularly, um, not going to get, not going to get me going any faster than I go normally. Yeah. So it has to be something kind of driving rock or, yeah. or metal no one's or listening something. to Stephen Fry reads Harry Potter just before exactly. they get in the octagon at but UFC, I, are they? But with the row, I put an audio book on a number of times. Just, I mean, during the row, I could when I was rowing, I could listen to it and actually get a story. I was listening to a big book, which is about, you know, it's a good sort of 50, 60 hours of listening, which is Shantaran, which is an amazing book. But then I would try and listen to it to help. And it would immediately, as soon as I got in the cabin, I'd fall asleep and then forget where I was on the book and going back and finding the place. In the end, I used it as a kind of sleep method. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it. But oh, when right. I was awake and sentient and rowing and I could listen to it, I found it quite, that was okay. Because rowing is kind of, as I said, much less, um, there's much less impact. You know, yeah. the rhythm is is totally different. So it was okay to do, you know. I chose, a, you know, rowing the Atlantic, you're sitting down. What could be easier? <laughs> what could be easier? <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier getting uh, like, uh, uh, injuries on your arse when you're doing that. That's not something I'd say. Uh, uh, we, we've all had an I arse injury. Lucky. I was lucky. I, um, having done the Tour de France before, um, I, I know a lot about arse management. Um, and basically, if I, you know, you get... A, I need shares in Sudacrim, uh, the nappy <laughs> rash cream, because literally it, prevention is better than the cure. So I was just oh. you know, not shy in slathering on layers and layers of that stuff before, during and after. <laughs> and I got away with it. You know, there were some people with some horrendous wounds. I won't oh, show dear. you the pictures, but we were taking photos of them and showing them to them going, here, that's what you're asking. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not good. 
I, I've just got to say that that's got to be on a CV, clean driver's license, <laughs> Microsoft Word, arse management. That's got arse to management. get that. That's got to get you in a door of any job, <laughs> I would think. Um, uh, but it's the diversity amongst these adventures that you that you do. I mean, uh, we've we've got to speak to athletes that have just been uh, Ironman competitors, have maybe just been runners or downhill mountain bikers. But there's there's so much different stuff within what you're doing. We have to talk about the most obvious one that's in here before we we've talked about a lot of the athleticism and what have you. But um, principal tenor with the Royal Philharmonic or <laughs> concert orchestra. Yeah. Um, it's Talk us through this because we haven't mentioned this at any point up to this point. It's a what weird is one, this all about? Some people think, I mean, obviously, there's anyone that's been on an event will, with me will know that, you know, mm. I, I like to bash out a Ness and Dorma, um, uh, you know, before, during, and after because that's what everyone wants to hear. But I suppose, I mean, I never really formally trained as an opera singer. Um, wow. I. I, w I was always, as I said, I wanted to be a rock star. So when I was at school and stuff, I was singing Bat Out of Hell and Queen tracks and nice. anything high, high tenor. You know, some of those old yeah. rock stars have got amazing voices, essentially. So that was kind of in my range. And then a few years, I can't remember the year, but just after I got out of rehab, I think there was a there was a TV show called Opportunity. Um, and it was like a, a stars in your eyes type show, you know, where you uh, one of these talent shows where they were looking for opera talent. Um, right. And it was done by Channel 4, and it was a little bit, you know, it was a bit, it wasn't as cruel as uh, Britain's Got Talent and things like that, you know, the judging and things was a little bit nicer and, and the way they did it. So I entered that, sent them in a sent them in a tape of me singing whilst I was re-roofing a house and, you know, singing <laughs> a bit of Italian opera stuff. And they were like, holy cow. Um, and I got pretty far. I didn't win it. Um, but right. I, got, I was like the last tenor in the competition, and uh, and then from that, it, I'm, I kind of recorded an album of my own crossover stuff, and then with the album, I was trying to chase basically a career in music at the time. Okay. And the opportunity came up because there was there was um, there was a guy who sang for the Welsh National Opera. And he used to do these concerts around the country, um, let's say, singing at, at, at great big country houses. You sing with a big orchestra. There's a Spitfire fly past, that okay. kind of thing. You know, people going to 6,000 people are going to take a picnic and watch. And uh, luckily he was tied up because he had a bit of filming to do because he was uh, he was filming for some adverts. Um, go, compare. Ah, no way. When he I was, was literally filming. just talking about him the other day. I was literally when, just talking about him the other really, day. Really? When he was yeah. off filming, I would step in and take his place on the opera circuit. Um, so I, it was my luck that he that he had a few days off. And uh, and then when I got the chance, I'd go and sing. No, it's terrifying. I'd never even bloody sung. Yeah, I'd never really sung in front of more than 50 people before. And then suddenly I was there in front of 6,000, winging it yeah. again. You know, <laughs> one of the scaredest I've been in my entire life, I would say, out of all the things I've done, I was, I was, I was, you know, the first time I did it, I was vomiting in the morning with nerves. I didn't have, a, you know, I was thinking they're going to find me out. I was terrified I was going to get found out. Um, that I knew that there was a professional orchestra going to be backing me. And so I had to go for rehearsal and I was thinking they're going to find me out. They're going to think you're such an idiot. Why do you think you could even do this? You know? You're really going to get found out. And actually, so first rehearsal, orchestra strikes up. I'm shitting myself. Start singing. About 20 seconds into it, I thought, you got this. And I got that shivery feeling over me thinking, I can wing this. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> um, and they were kind. I mean, I know I'm not, you know, I've sung big concerts in front of a lot of people. If I sang on the stage at the Royal Opera House, I'm sure there'd be quite a lot of opera buffs who go, "Ooh, oh my God!" You know, he's not—that's not quite as good as he could be. But I'm good enough to fool a lot of people. Oh, wow! It's you know, you talked about you want to be a a rock star and a film star. I do not envy the person that has to the actor that gets cast as you in the movie of your life because don't, that's going to be a difficult one. That's going to be a difficult one. I've got I'm. I'm Mm. All right, I'm going to blow my own trumpet here. Go on, After the seven marathons in seven continents, there was a little film made about me on ESPN, which, which followed my journey. Right. And then a film producer who produced like the Maze Runner and things got hold of me and said, can we buy your story? 
And then they are in the process. They've written a screenplay. They've written this, you know, like screenplay, which was me reading me as the film star in my own life. And it was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got hold of a chap called Josh Gad, who is the oh. voice of someone in Frozen. I, I know. He's, he's yeah. the voice of Olaf. And, and he uh, looks a bit like me. And, he's, and his voice sounds very like mine uh, when he sings. And Oh, they, my God. It they actually contacted does. him. So he he he's been asked whether he'd play me. Now half these films never get made. So now they're yeah. waiting, now they're looking for a director. Now that every five or six months we get a call from Hollywood, and right. uh, and it's just it makes us you know wet our pants a little bit, and then we remember that it probably won't happen. But it's uh, it's 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 quite it's it's we love it. It's so fun. We're like half the family go. Well, who's going to play me? <laughs> no one. It's never going to happen. But it's fun to dream. Oh, you always play that dream casting. I mean, you can you can always hold it over other members of the family. It's like, well, I've got Lassie. Yeah, so I want Jack Black. I want Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's such a it's such a unique journey. The goal compare guy. Literally, we were talking about what a good really? actual hey. opera singer he was in real life. Yeah, he's uh, a proper opera singer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really uh, proper. <laughs> yeah, because I I think like it's kind of weird as, as a slight detachment how people really seem to hate the goal compare guy, but now they really love the goal compare yeah. guy. It's uh, yeah. it's one of those things. It's like the bulldog from the insurance yes. advert. The, oh, oh yes, guy. Oh, oh yes, oh yes. Um, right. Well, we had to get past the the Philharmonic Orchestra thing raising money for charity. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is a, a, I know this has been a, an ongoing story throughout what you've done. The figure yeah. that I have in front of me, and this might not be up to date, is uh, £250,000 raised for a yeah. uh, charity. Um, was that something you felt that you needed to do because of your your journey to your point? Or was it something that you thought is another positive to get out it, of, of winging it, it? It all started in a different place, then it became something else, and then it snowballed mm. and... Uh, you know, everyone, you, you know, you start off doing raising money for charity because everyone else does when you do a marathon type thing. So it started yeah. off, it started off with raising, you know, wow, okay, Ted's doing a marathon and I happen to raise five grand or whatever for the first marathon. And mm -hmm. then it was, oh, Ted's doing something a bit more extreme. So raised quite a lot more the second time. And then, um, then it came down to, then it got personal. And then, and then, uh, say my wife was diagnosed with MS and there was an ms charity that we worked with quite closely and then so when i then when i next did my big event then it went boom you know because basically my wife sophie is a lot more loved than i am uh and so she's an extremely popular lady and lovely so so uh, i think people were prepared to dip their hands in their pockets and then i really pushed it you know i really went for the fundraising and chased it and chased it and chased it now, to the detriment of any form of training you know it became social media hammering 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 people and and it did very well you know it was a successful way of raising money um and i suppose recently the last couple of events i've done i've, I've been lucky i've done well i've got a really nice i've got an amazing well and pool of people that i've gone to who are incredibly generous but in the end you are going to the same well of people every time yeah. so and i don't feel bad about that people only give if they want to give you know, so and and I'm and I'm pleased that people do continue to give because I think it's important that we all try and stretch ourselves on how much we give to those that need it more. Um, and this latest one, I suppose that total is probably up to about three hundred thousand now because this latest one I'm up to, oh, I don't know, for the Atlantic, I'm on about thirty five thousand pounds raised in the last couple of months. So um, yeah, it's ticky over. It's not so much about that. I suppose that can make me feel good about myself yeah uh, do i do it for that no I, it's it i kind of do it because that's kind of expected you don't want people people won't support my events if i'm just doing them from solely for my pleasure yeah um and i wouldn't expect anyone to donate for me to do anything that didn't cause me pain and, and people <laughs> can make a connection with your genuine passion your general your genuine heart for the charities you're doing it for as well. And yeah. it makes them form that connection with what you're doing, but obviously makes them raise money for a fantastic cause yeah. as well. That's very yeah. cool. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. That's uh, it's uh, uh, incredible. But um, yeah. these, these so many other, th this just keeps going. We've, we've talked about some of the successes, well, kind of yeah. successes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, coming in the, we've had the successes, the achievements coming in third and fourth place. Even in, I, would, I was smiling at the, 
the opera TV show as well, because once again, you didn't come first, you came last, but you seem to have done better than other yeah. people that were on the show. Yeah. So, um, but we have to talk about the uh, the helicopter rescue from yeah. the Atlantic Ocean. I think um, I we've had people on the show that have been through some journeys, but I don't think we've ever had anyone that has had quite a, a, a grandiose rescue than <laughs> that. a grandiose exit from an event, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose it's befitting of, of the stuff, like the way I go about things. Um, basically, we had a, you know, an adventure that I was, I was trying to row the Atlantic about four or five years ago. I had, my son was on the boat with me, um, wow. I think at the time he might have been about 21 or 22, mm -hmm. um, my eldest son. Um, my brother was on and a bunch of other mates. And basically the, the, the adventure was, was coming to an end. Let's put it, let's put it like that. And, okay. and it, it, it became apparent that we needed to call in help. With a, and we were about 250 miles off the coast. We were two and a half days into the adventure, into what was going to be a 35, 40 day adventure. So um a very disappointed ted rang falmouth coast guard on the satellite phone and said we need picking up please and they they coordinate everything from falmouth wherever you are i think in the northern hemisphere falmouth send out the coast guard from spain or wherever and oh, this right. socking great big helicopter came over and winch you know send down a winch man and then i had to go up on the winch without the winch man and with a guy who wasn't very well um, on the on the um, he'd he'd been uh, peeing blood, and his name's Giorgio Advanis, and he's from Greece, mm -hmm. and he'd not been very well. And I couldn't believe it when I was rowing the Atlantic. I got the news that he was also rowing the Atlantic, the couple of like last month, and no that, way. and that he had just completed an Atlantic row. Um, so his his failed expedition meant nothing now because he just he just got across. And then I was just so nice that two of us so far have now got across. And I know that others have got other things in the pipeline. But yeah. when we got rescued by the helicopter, the, most, the indignity um, was that we left everything behind on the boat. Everything. So the oh. because of the weight of 12 crew members or 10 crew members, they wouldn't let us bring anything. So we had a grab bag and it had all our passports in it and a few sat phones and a few other heavy items. They said, no, 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 we'll come back for that if we've got time. We left that. So we were stuck in Gran Canaria with no passports, nothing. We, they gave us some shiny tracksuits and some flip-flops. And it was, you know, you really had a feeling of what it was like to be a refugee because we couldn't wow. sleep anywhere. No hotel would take us because we didn't have passports. We didn't have mobile phones to make any calls. They'd done their job. They'd rescued us. But it's not their yeah. job to then sort us out, you know, a bunch of middle class adventure you know that's not their remit you know so we then had to sort ourselves out and we basically relied on the kindness of strangers you know so some guy a really nice guy just totally he he rescued us essentially and put us up in a place and helped sort us out and told us how to go and get emergency passports and we were i was at the lowest ebb in my life i would say you know and um you know strangely enough that disappointment was that lasted in the last few years that probably lasted two and a half years of, of extreme disappointment that I hadn't mm. really worked out how to process um, or anything. And I think I went into a real slump, uh, right. a real low, and which I'm now <laughs> well and truly out of. Uh, yes. But I sought, I sought help, you know, and I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about mental health and things these days and which I think is just so important. And it took me two and a half years to ask for help you know i mm. just couldn't work out what was wrong i'd lost my mojo completely i just didn't know what to do um until i kind of reached out and said i'm i'm a bit broken and i need some help and then from that point forward life's been amazing which brings me to the uh the mindset coach aspect of mm. uh of what what you've been doing and learning from i don't want to say learning from the failures but having to go through them and it's how you you turn into the curve and, and take them away one of the one of the one of the regular things that we've seen here on broadcast when we've talked to all these athletes and actors and comedians it's it, it makes me laugh how much synergy there actually is between all these things um um where, where did that come from that you wanted to start sharing that knowledge? Is that something that's always been there or, no, or no, was I it you unpacking your own thing? I don't think I know. I know. I, I think I lacked a lot of direction early on. Right. I was doing, I think I was doing a lot of these challenges to fill a hole that I didn't know existed mm -hmm. um, to try and get some validation from others 
especially you know I, I just wanted people to see that I was worthy or whatever and and they would always work that would always work but for a very short period of time um and you know because you you know I'd come back heroic from these things and then that was gone you know then it was like now what now what now what so as opposed to yeah. the me being happy with the journey of life I was only happy for very short periods of time and then I suppose that fa that Atlantic failure for me really really hit me hard mm. and it wasn't as I said when I asked for help I know I, I asked I got myself a coach and uh, right. and I, 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 I really didn't know what that meant and I didn't know what that would look like and it was quite a big scary step for me actually the you know my coach was a client of mine in another job that I do um, uh -huh. and where I actually, you know, I work in, I worked in a school and um, mm. I was looking after his son. So therefore I was going to someone saying, I look after your son, but I'm broken. And I understand you do something that might help with that. And he was like, brilliant, let's get it on. Um, and we got it on and it was like magic. Um, so getting coached by him was almost like instant magic for me. Um, and I, couldn't believe the positive effect that it had on my life and the way he guided me through what I had to, what I had to do to, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's magic. He worked his magic on me and I wanted to learn how to do that magic with other people because it was, I wanted to be able to give that to other people is amazing because of where I knew where I was and I knew where I'd got to in a very short space of time. And yeah. I thought if I can learn how to do that and then combine it with everything I've learned through all the things I've done, um, I think that could be something quite special. And so that's what I set out to do. So when I got myself trained, I enrolled on um, all sorts of courses and uh, and what have you, and then just uh, dive headlong into it. As with everything, you know, there's, yeah. there's no way you're going to learn without just doing it. You know, there's no substitute for getting out there and making mistakes. And also understanding that any mistakes I make, we're never what's the consequence of them i wasn't going to be doing any harm most of the things i was doing and and doing now only do good you know if you don't quite get it right you do less good as opposed to any harm so right. uh, you know so that's that's where the the whole sort of mindset stuff came in and and i figured i could use everything i'd done thus far especially the rehab the addiction the alcoholism mm. and all that and use my personal experience for good that's incredible that's incredible. Sorry, one of my kids is trying to push a, a picture under the Go door on. at the same Go time. On. I was just thinking, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, um, but it's like you say, it's using those experiences to build up. You know, because I think sometimes people don't read back into the the positives and negatives of what they've done and how to learn from those. Yeah. And this coach, like you say, I mean, that's a it's a terrifying aspect. I don't know if it's part of the male condition. I don't know if it's part of just being a human being. Is realizing that you're broken. And actually asking for help and yeah. taking positive steps. I mean, all you need to do, we, we spoke about Facebook earlier very briefly. It's a sway with uh, coaches and ideas and a yeah. lot of them I don't necessarily have a lot of time for. But there's some no. really good people within there. Yeah. Um, when did you realize this was was working for you in that period? And this was something like this is this is a. This is a last peg, maybe, and what I want to be. I I love the fact that I'll open myself up and go on these adventures and and wing yeah. it. And but when was when did it really click home of this might be something else that was missing that I didn't even realize? Yeah, I'd say that. I mean, that was fairly recent in the last couple of years, really. Yeah. You know, um, I, I it's it's weird because it, you know, as you said, we don't we're not great. I'm not great at self reflection, self analysis. It was kind mm. of going like a bull headlong into life. And thinking there was only one way and not really looking at it. Um, and also, especially even in preparation for this, this, this Atlantic road. Yeah. Um, for the first time, probably in, in many of the events I've done, I was, I really got myself into a place where I'd kind of made this not about the Ted Jackson's show. I mean, mm. my life is the Ted Jackson show. And however much I try when I go on an event and stuff and say, no, come on, keep your head down. Don't make it about you. And I end up making it about me. But it was this was much less about what the praise I was going to get and everything yeah. from everyone else. And it was much more about this is your journey and you're loving it. You know, so when I was out there on the, you know, I didn't think about the finish line. I thought about enjoy what you're doing. Get, you know, anytime I found it tough, it was like, well, this is fun. Look, you're living. Yeah. You are you are alive. You're living. 
just row and enjoy it. And and I could just immediately, I could always just flick that switch in my head and go, this is great. And you're living and you're loving. And yeah. it was much less about, it, yeah, I was totally unconcerned about the people back home going, you're a fucking legend, which is what I always wanted. Um, and now I'm so less invested in that. It's incredible. Oh, this is incredible. And and you're passing this on to to other people now in a, in a, from a way that, I don't want to say the, the swathes of books and maybe more conventional ways of doing it, you're able to communicate it to them in a unique way? Hopefully I can just do it in a, in a yeah, I mean, I see these books and I, and I, I hey, I've read most of them. Um, yeah. and, and, um, and you, most of those books have got one great point in them. You know, they're all based on one great point. And normally that great point is get out there and do it. Um, yeah. and don't be afraid to make mistakes, uh, which is, which is great. And I'm sure I'm, I want to write my own book, but it's not going to be conventional. And I, I would say that the way I do things, I want to do it in a, in a way that makes people feel comfortable in a way that people think, actually, he's just a normal guy. He's all right. Yeah. Yeah, I am just I'm just the bloke next door and the guy that just who decides to go and do stuff. Um, and hopefully I'm, you know, I'm not some buffed Greek god that that puts you off thinking, um, yeah. oh, well, it's all right. He started off with those attributes. So therefore, of course, he's like that, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah hopefully from a from a. The oh. NHS track and trace who so they'll be like oh is that what it was because I'm in isolation here and they're trying to track me down so oh uh, goodness that, that might that might go off again sorry I'm on my phone no don't worry um, about that don't worry yeah. about that yeah so so hopefully just from a sort of every every man perspective let's say I mean I I say that I'm sitting here I'm 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 lucky I'm a I'm a white middle class man you know so yeah, yeah I'm sure there'd be people going yes it's all right for you privileged yeah but I make, I make my luck. You know, I, I, you know, a lot of the time is making my luck. Um, and I think I connect with people from all walks of life. You know, I'm, I'm more than happy. Some of my, some of my best friends are like the kebab man or the bin man. <laughs> you know, I connect with them better than I connect with people that maybe I'm supposed to connect with. Uh, well, there, there is so much this. We're all going to look forward to the Hollywood movie. That's all I've got to say. Uh, yeah. That's going to be incredible. Very quickly, I know that you do have a website where people can uh, check out what's going on. Uh, I don't want to get it wrong, but what is the name of your website again, uh, Ted? www.rebelintheArena.com. So, Re Rebel in the Arena. Rebel in the Arena. Yeah, taking on that from that Roosevelt speech of the man in the arena, you know, the man who's getting out there and doing shit and, and maybe just doing it in a slightly different way. <laughs> well, uh, but there's one last thing we, we always like to do here on uh, broadcast. There's a little bit of this or that where we get to know people in just under a little bit. So it's a this or that question thing. These okay. are being set in by the listeners. You just need to tell me what do you prefer, one or the other. We've got okay. uh, flip-flops or slippers? Uh, flip-flops. Oh, good shout. Netflix or YouTube? Netflix. Oh, controversial. Football or soccer? Oh, for God's sake. Neither. Rugby. Ah, um, yes! <laughs> a man very much after my own heart. Uh, Dr. Pepper or Mountain Dew? Oh, God, both disgusting. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pepper. If you have to, it's the closest yeah, thing to, to cola. It's the closest thing. Uh, Google or Apple? Ooh, uh, Google. Oh, good shout, good shout. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. L look messy or tidy? <laughs> look messy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, buying or renting? Ooh, uh, buying. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the way to go. Uh, let's see. Uh, a popcorn or a hot dog? Ooh, I'm vegan now. Popcorn. Oh, good show, good show. And finally, and this seems to be a bone of contention between all the people that watch uh, broadcast. <sighs> Pineapple on a pizza or no pineapple on a pizza? <laughs> no pineapple. No pineapple. <laughs> I think I think some of this is my fault because I don't mind it. I didn't say You're I weird. liked it. I don't mind it. I just don't I know, mind but it. I understand why people think that it is is abomination. <laughs> An abomination. There should only that... ever be double chili and pepperoni on a pizza. Simple as oh. that. Double chili. That's, a, Double that's, chili. An interest, that's an interesting take on it. Well, look, yeah. uh, we can check you out. Rebel in the Arena. Make sure to check out the website. Ted, what I'm going to do is I'm just quickly going to pop you back into the green room and I'll finish up this bad boy for the boys and girls. Thanks, Ladies buddy. and gentlemen. Thanks for having me.
make sure to check everything out Ted's up to. Uh, that was an awesome episode of broadcast. I hope you'll check out everything that's going on with Ted over at. For all I know, right now, he's taking a phone call and is already arranging a marathon into space at this point. I get the feeling he would do no training and he would just be up there in t- 10 seconds flat. Uh, make sure to check out our next episode of broadcast. That's going to be next Sunday. You can, of course, check out the archives of this episode and all the other ones. Sorry, that's my son again over at YouTube and at Spotify and, of course, everything that's going over on Broadcast. up social media. I've been Billy Kirkwood, I suppose. Uh, We'll see you next time. Let's finish up the show. Bye! (laughs)